Chris Pinter with us uh, today, uh, uh, the, the former lead of uh, cybersecurity uh, issues at the State Department, now the chair of the GFC Foundation. Uh, Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining. Happy to be here. Uh, well, you know that all the eyes are, or many of the eyes are basically uh, towards the meeting of uh, Biden and Putin uh, with some hopes that uh, the tensions in the cyberspace particularly could maybe go down. And I will start with a, with a straight question uh, for you. Are you an optimist? Uh, do, you, do you see that the tensions can actually go down after this meeting when it comes to cyber? Well, I, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. I mean, there's been, you know, there's a reason the tensions are so high. There's been, you know, really over a number of years now, uh, a lot of, I'd say, destabilizing conduct coming out of Russia. And that's not just in cyberspace, it's in the physical world too. Uh, so we have to be realistic in looking at that. You know, certainly things like uh, election interference goes to the heart of our democracy. It's not something we can just say, okay, everything's fine now. You know, we're done. We're, we're over it. So I think we have to, you know, we have to, you know, reach. I think a more stable. And this is what the Biden administration said: we want a more predictable relationship with Russia across the board. And I think that's right for lots of reasons that make sense. But at the same time, we have to be able to raise concerns we have and raise them strongly. And, and see if we can get any action on them, uh, which I think is going to be a tough, a t you know, a tough order going into Geneva. But I think that's important. What do you think is, is are the main issues uh, on, on this agenda? I've uh, read recently some of the analysis that, for instance, one of the challenges might be actually understanding where the red lines are. Uh, so is it is it one of the things that it's uh, about understanding where the red lines are and how each party might react and so on, avoiding escalation, or is it much more complex? Well, I think it's part of that. You know, we, we, we did agree with Russia early on. We had the first bilateral CBMs, uh, confidence building measures with Russia, including exchanging doctrine, having a hotline, using the nuclear risk reduction center, the actual you know, hotline, which is more of a teletype system, but also having a physical hotline to use in cyber incidents. There were a number of things that were done. So those kind of stability efforts, I think are important, whatever our relations are with Russia. Indeed, we had those kind of stability efforts during the Cold War on nuclear issues. So, so I do think, um, you know, one of the issues is, you know, what is it we're concerned about and why are we concerned about it? Now, you know, interestingly, I think the, the recent uh, affirmation in the, the group of governmental experts in the UN and the, in the open-ended working group reaffirmed some basic rules of the road that I think we're concerned about, you know, attacks on critical infrastructure in peacetime, um, you know, going after electoral systems. Those are things that even Russia has agreed they wouldn't do. And also harboring uh, criminals, really harboring, uh, uh, you know, when you have malicious conduct from, coming from your territory, there's an expectation you're gonna take action. And so I think it's perfectly fair uh, to hold Russia to those commitments and say, look, you know, these are things responsible countries should do. And that's a pretty clear red line, you know, don't do these things. Uh, and then we need to enforce them. If we don't, enforce and bring up these these agreements that have been made, then they end up being just a little more than words on paper. So I think we, we need to do that. Now, you, you may be right that there are different perspectives on what the red line is. Uh, you need to be careful not to define the red line with such certainty that people creep up just to that red line and don't go over. That's always a concern too. Um, but I think these are these are pretty clear. Now, you know, I think where there's gonna be disagreement is, uh, first of all, I don't expect Russia to say, yes, it was us, we did this. We did the election interference, for instance. They, they have denied all these things in the past, as you'd expect them to do. They denied the Ukraine invasion, you know, the little green men too. So, so I think that you're gonna see the same thing. Uh, so I don't expect Putin to say, yeah, you got us. <laughs> um, but I, then I think that the second part of that conversation is I, th I think that they think that anything that criticizes their government is also election interference. And I think that's a very different thing. So I think it's it's getting some understanding about what we're talking about. And here it's really going after and trying to change the voting habits in the US and undermining and not just the US, but around the world. So that's, that's one issue. Um, but red lines are, are part of the larger discussion. However, I think some of the conduct we've seen, not petty uh, election interference, um, you know, the recent ransomware attacks are pretty clear. And I'd say on that, on the ransomware attacks, which appear to be criminal groups operating from Russia, there may be a chance, there may be a glimmer of hope for a little more cooperation. Now, that's interesting because uh, we can see that the, the Biden administration in a way responded in, I'll say in two ways. One was 
a hard line uh, on, on the solar winds. And the other one was a more soft line, let's cooperate against cybercrime. But some would say that um, while there is a huge interest for the US to actually resolve this, this sort of uh, attacks against this territory, on the other hand, Russians might not have that much of the incentives uh, because they have obviously, or it's seemingly at least according to some close relation to the crime milieu in a way, which is which is uh, within their territory. So what do you think, would there be sufficient incentives on both sides, particularly on the Russian side also, to come up to some sort of agreement? No, it's a fair question. And, and first, I'd like to say that, you know, yes, the sanctions and other things done after solar winds, but solar winds and a lot of other activity were bundled together, were significant. But interestingly, the Biden administration didn't throw the kitchen sink at, at Russia. There were other things they could have done you know, that people talked about going after Putin's finances, doing things to expose corruption, they didn't do. So they left some things on, uh, off the table, I think, to allow some room to negotiate, to have, you know, uh, to have some room to say, let's sit down, let's talk, let's try to reach an, an agreement. We're not gonna go, we, we have some room to, to escalate if we need to, but we won't for now. Um, on, the, on the ransomware thing, yeah, it's interesting. On the one hand, I think to the extent that, that Putin's worldview is anything that destabilizes the West or hurts the West or hurts America is good for Russia, which I think is his worldview right now. Um, the fact that criminal groups are doing it and causing disruption in the US plays into his playbook to some extent. And so he doesn't really have an incentive to cut it back. But on the other hand, if the, and, and we know for years, I used to chair a G8 when the G8 existed a G7 group for many years on cybercrime. It was always hard to get cooperation from Russia on cybercrime. This is not new. Uh, and you're right. Part of the reason is as long as they're not attacking Russian targets, the Russian government's like, man, you know, it's not really hurting us. Um, but now I think this has gotten such high profile attention. Uh, this is not flying under the radar. There may be um, some value for Putin to say, OK, uh, I'm going to take action because these are not, you know, I'm not going to take action against my own government. What we do, we do it. We're going to continue to do it. But you know, for these these rogue criminal groups, they're getting a little too noisy now. So I'm going to take some action. I'm going to show that that we're going to take action against them now. I and mean, frankly, if they want to, Russia can make you know the Russian government can make the lives of these groups miserable if they wanted to, um, and, and they haven't so far. Now, the worry then is even if they do that, is this like in Casablanca where it's we're going to round up the usual suspects and it's just sort of a public relations thing that moves on, or is this more serious? So I do think that's why I think there's some room for negotiation here. You know, I'm not overly optimistic that that's going to happen, but I think there's at least some possibility. I have to get back to looking at the incentives on the Russian side <clears throat> uh, to the statement that Putin made, uh, when was it, in September last year, I think, uh, which was quite a clear proposal to, to the Trump administration, what could be some sort of uh, elements of the agreement and so on, yet it was, it seems, completely ignored by the Trump administration. Do you think that certainly there were comments, yes, that, that was happening at the right time when actually the solar winds hack was underway? So it was sort of a, whether it was a smoke uh, curtain or something else. But do you think that those are the elements and that was maybe the, the sincere uh, interest of the Russian side uh, to actually come up to some of the elements or that was really sort of a, a smoke curtain or something? I, I think you have to build uh, a lot of framework back first before you get to that point. Um, you know, you may remember back um, in Putin's first meeting with President Trump, where President Trump came out with this idea that they wanted a impenetrable cyber unit, which no one, and I was in the government at the time, no one understood what that was, you know, and, and it was quickly abandoned by Trump. What I suspect happened is Putin raised exactly the same issue to have a, a dialogue. There was a high level White House and State Department dialogue, interagency dialogue with Russia that was suspended after the Ukraine uh, incursion and remains suspended. So there is not a high level formal dialogue between Russia and the US on these issues. Now, dialogue can be a good thing if it has a purpose, if it has some chance of actually making some dent on some of these issues. If it's, if it's just a show trial, if it's just like, hey, we're having a dialogue, so everything's okay, that doesn't serve the US interest. It doesn't serve, you know, it may serve Russia's interest because, you know, nothing to see here, we're moving on. So we have to make sure this is not just a, a political statement. It has to be something that's gonna serve our interests and I suspect Russia's interest too. And for me, that means we got a, a lot of legwork to do to try to build back up a stable and predictable relationship as Jake Sullivan said, before we get to just having a big high level dialogue and saying, okay, we're having a high level dialogue, nothing to see here. So I think that's, that's the issue. And I, I suspect that when Putin made that offer 
back at the end of the Trump administration, that was consistent with offers that had been made before. That wasn't the first time, it may be the first time Putin made it himself, but it was an offer that had been raised several times to re reestablish that high level dialogue. And like with any country, we need to we need to go in with it to it with our eyes wide open. What are we going to, we going to achieve? What are the reasons for it? You know, talk just for talk is not going to get you where you need to go. So I think we need to calibrate that. And and part of it is seeing if we can, you know, we can come to a more stable relationship in the long term with Russia, which I think is in everyone's interest that we can. Um, but we're not close to being there yet. But if you look at the the success success that you mentioned, the GGE and the Open Ended Working Group, which definitely, I mean, particularly the GGE uh, hosts both sides, and then even the breakthrough to some extent in in the further dialogue in the OSC, seems that there is cooperation. There, things are maybe coming to something. Is it is that a base for optimism in a way that we have some agreements we can build on? It is. I mean, look, first of all, you know, we and they can walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, not everything happens uh, on one script. Um, and I am heartened by the fact that we were able to reach a consensus in the group of governmental experts. Many people thought that wasn't going to happen, uh, just like many people thought there wouldn't be consensus in the OEWG. But particularly after the OEWG, many people thought Russia would say, OK, I have no... We have no interest in reaching a consensus here. And the fact is not only did they reach a consensus, but it was a pretty robust one. There was some good language in there that articulated what you did with the existing norms, reaffirmed international law, including for the first time mentioning international humanitarian law, which sounds like a no brainer, but believe me, if you know anything about these negotiations, that's a big deal. Um, you mentioned infrastructure that included election infrastructure, for instance. So there were, there were and, and you know, reinforce these things about harboring uh, wrongdoers in your territory. So, so really strong statements. And, and I think, um, that is, uh, that is a bright spot that maybe could be built on. Um, but it doesn't mean all the other issues have gone away. So, you know, so, so I, I, I think that there may be, there are times just like we do with every country around the world, you, you cooperate when you can, and you don't, when you can't, you know, so if we can find, if we can find common ground to cooperate in a realistic way that actually leads to something that's going to be a more stable environment, I think we'll do that. Um, but I think again, we have to, we have to go in with our eyes wide open. We have to understand, you know, it, 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 there is a little bit of duplicity when you're saying, "Hey, we, no one country should do this," and you're doing it at the same time. So you have to get beyond that and think about how you can actually make sure that there's accountability when countries do this. I mean, I think that's been the missing piece. We haven't been good at making countries accountable, doing things that 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 force them to really follow these rules without being escalatory. But I guess this also boils down to the top level and then the, the broader context of relations, not just cyber and the interest. One thing that struck me that was quite interesting in the GGE report uh, was um, more of the elaboration of what might be the requirements for the attribution? Not a requirement, but sort of suggestions that um, there should be more, certainly as it was before, uh, beyond just you know saying. But in a number of places, it reiterates uh, the need for cooperation and uh, direct communication between the parties. Yeah. Uh, and that even some sort of evidences of cooperation before actually anything else is done. Is that a step forward? To me, that looked like, okay, there is some sort of consensus between the two sides. So, I, you know, look, I don't think it's unreasonable to say there should be some communication. And I think even in the past there has been, you know, when, uh, you know, communication takes several forms, including saying you did it. You know? <laughs> and you say publicly you did it, that's a form of communication. Um, uh, and, and certainly I think there's been private communication in the past. Uh, and, and, you know, the answer you usually get back or often always get back is no, we didn't. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's benefit in that. I don't think, you know, the GG report did not agree on any kind of evidentiary standards, certainly. Uh, and it also did not say that countries need to disclose all their information. Now, no, you know, I still think ultimately attribution is a political issue. Countries, when countries make attribution, it's, you know, it's done based on the evidence they have, certainly. They don't do it without evidence. The reason they don't do it without evidence is that if they're wrong, it substantially undercuts them in future events. You know, if you get it wrong and you say, X country did this, and then it's clear that X country didn't do it, the next time it's like the boy who called wolf, you know, cried wolf. You do it the next time, no one believes you. So there's a there's a substantial you know pressure on countries to get it right. And that's why the US op often takes a long, fairly long time before they make attribution. Um, but I don't think there's a, a clear evidentiary standard. 
but yes, of course it has to be based on evidence. It can't be based on conjecture. So I think, I think those statements were consistent with reality that, you know, that it should be based on uh, evidence, looking at all the facts. It doesn't say you have to disclose all your evidence. No country is going to do that, including Russia and China. Um, you know, that's, that's not realistic when some of the evidence may be based on intelligence information or sensitive law enforcement information. But I, but I do think it, it realizes that attribution claims should not be made lightly. And that's true too. And I think that's, you know, I, I think that's fair. Um, and that's why I think when we've done these collective attributions, when another number of countries come together and do it, that has more force than any one country doing it alone. Well, at least some step forward. Now, if we if we place ourselves on 16th of, of June in Geneva, uh, and two of them meet, and let's be light optimist that something will come out, what would that mean in practice? What do you envisage if we can say, yes, we made a a little bit of detente or at least a little bit of pressure down, what would that mean in practice? Well, it's, it's you know, one thing that, that has just been amazing to me because I've been doing cyber now for about over 30 years is the amount of attention the cyber issue has gotten with respect to the summit. You know, it is not, it is one of the main issues, you know, having the national security advisor talking about having the president talking about before the summit, that's pretty significant. Usually cyber would be down like 12 or 13 on the uh, on the agenda if they're at all. So that's really important. Is it the same on the Russian side? Do you have the impression that it's also on the Russian side? I, I think so. I mean, I think, look, there are a lot of things the Russian side is concerned about, but I think, you know, this has become a, a big issue and it's come up in conversations, the high level conversations, and it continued well. I mean, it reminds me a bit of what the theft of intellectual property in China, where at first it was an issue that, you know, China was like, well, why are you even raising this? But it, we raised it significantly enough and often enough that it became an issue. And there was an actual agreement on that um, that then became a G20 uh, uh, commitment. Not that that's necessarily been obeyed, but at least there's been, you know, there was there was some negotiation. So, you know, I don't expect everything, you know, even if I'm optimistic, I don't expect everything to come out of Geneva and everything's hunky-dory and, and good. Um, I think, you know, what we might expect is some way to start at a working level uh, you know, strengthening the existing kind of channels of communication, that might be one area. So it's not full on, yes, let's have a big meeting all the time, but let's strengthen those. I think that's a possibility. I think another possibility uh, might be some commitment to cooperate on international cybercrime. That's a possible, I mean, that's a glimmer for me. That's a, that would be great if that happened, but I think it's possible. Um, so I, I think you can see some things like that where they'll be, and the fact they're meeting itself, you know, having a summit, I think indicates that there's seriousness on both sides. Um, but I don't expect I don't expect amazing uh, progress. I think this could be incremental, uh, but incremental is okay. Incremental is better than nothing, and I think incremental does help build that, you know, that uh, relationship for the future in a way that that I think will be productive for both sides. But but I, I think it's be modest i'm looking for modest commitments maybe modest discussions um but that's okay at this point i think you're, you're absolutely right you know with, with the current situation everything the, even the modest uh, moves ahead would be quite useful uh, i want to close with the, with the again another speculation if things go a little bit even if modest uh, uh, ahead uh could that actually have an effect an, an effect on on uh, global cybersecurity negotiations could it spill over with uh, with some more of a positive energy? Because we also have China and other players there. Could it be a, a little bit of a spillover effect? It, it could, uh, but you know, there's still deep seated differences, right? So, in, in these negotiations, so the U.S. and the and Europe and others are not going to go for a global cyber crime or cyber security treaty, uh, which Russia and China have been pushing. Especially Russia has been pushing for many years. Uh, you know, a, a cyber arms control treaty that doesn't make any sense. You know that's not going to change their minds on that. I, you know, the views on on issues about human rights and free flow of information, diametrically different views are not going to change uh, in the short term. I don't think. So a lot of you know international law can we make more progress? Maybe. I mean, one good thing about the GG is countries voluntarily put in their some at least put in their 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 views on international law. So there's some progress there. Um, but, you know, when you get beyond the agreements in the GG, it gets pretty tough. I mean, a lot of, you know, low and even medium hanging fruit you know, has been uh, uh, picked. So you're down to some issues where there are real differences between the two sides. So 
Yeah, I think it might put more energy into them. You have a new open-ended working group, the five-year one that's going to be chaired by uh, Sing Singapore, which I think is good. Um, that's good that it's being chaired by Singapore. Five years, I'm not sure it makes sense, but we'll see. Uh, you have a potential plan of action, a program of action um, that's being looked at. So I think there may be uh, the chance to have some renewed interest there, but you're never you're not going to get agreement on some of these core issues. You know, we also have the cybercrime negotiations in the third committee of the UN. And there again, you know, I think the US and the West view is, you know, content issues, you know, what, what some countries view as destabilizing speech or criticism of the government, you know, can't go into such a treaty. We're not going to agree to that. It doesn't matter what happens out of Geneva, that's not going to change. So, so yes, to extent maybe, but it's not going to change those, I think, entrenched positions and especially in the short term. In a nutshell, things are much more complex than uh, what can be resolved in one meeting, but we can hope that at least a, a small step can be made. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for, for this discussion and let's hope for some good news. Yeah? All right. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you. Thanks.